people are worrying that they're going to lose you, Andreas, to the altcoin sphere. Oh, no. Peter says, Recently, I see more and more people, especially on Twitter, commenting on whether you will remain faithful to Bitcoin. And in certain ways, I empathize. You certainly have never been in this for the money. That's why, that's what I truly and thoroughly believe. It makes me wonder why you would spend so much time on Ethereum and even writing a book about how to master Ethereum. I've always looked up to you as a person with a deep technical understanding, not only about Bitcoin, but about distributed systems in general. Looking at Ethereum from various angles just makes my heart bleed. It's saddening and goes against so many ideologies that you have been proclaiming and teaching over the years. So I guess the question is, why? Not for the money, not for the fame, and undoubtedly not for the technology. So why? Um, Peter, undoubtedly it is for the technology. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the reason I'm interested in Ethereum is because I'm interested in the application of blockchain technology to consensus networks that resolve the state of smart contracts. I'm interested in programmable blockchains. I'm interested in blockchains that use a virtual machine to resolve the state of smart contracts, so as to expand the state of possibilities and make programming blockchains much more flexible. Now, don't be under any illusion that what I'm doing, writing Mastering Ethereum, is writing a book about why you should invest in the particular chain launched by Vitalik Buterin and many others uh, back in 2014. I'm writing a book about uh, blockchains that use smart contracts within virtual machines. And the book I'm writing, it's called Mastering Ethereum, but it also applies to Ethereum Classic. It applies to Rootstock. It applies to Lisk. It applies to EOS. It applies to a variety of other virtual machine smart contract-based blockchains. I am fascinated by this technology, not because it provides better answers than Bitcoin, but because it provides different answers than Bitcoin. These technologies as a whole are about changing the trade-offs between security and flexibility. Um, Bitcoin is by far the blockchain that is the most secure, the most decentralized, and provides robust monetary systems. That's not the purpose of Ethereum, and it doesn't compete with Bitcoin at that. The purpose of Bitcoin is to take that trade-off and shift it to the other side, where it's more flexible in order to be able to do a much broader range of programmable smart contracts. And these programmable smart contracts are not going to be as secure as Bitcoin. That's a given. That's how the trade-off uh, works. And it, they're not going to be as scalable as Bitcoin, um, because the scalability is much more difficult to achieve when you're dealing with all of this state. Um, and they're not going to provide the robust monetary guarantees of Bitcoin, again, because that's not the trade-off that was aimed for. That doesn't mean that this technology is useful or useless. That's for the market to decide. And whether you want to write applications and smart contracts, dApps, things like that, up to you. Does it mean that this technology is interesting? Absolutely. And whether you agree with these trade-offs or not, they do open a whole new realm of technology uh, research, experimentation, and innovation. And right now, most of that research, experimentation, and innovation is being used to make shit coins by the truckload, and that's not good. But that's not the technology. The technology has opened the door. The fact that a whole bunch of idiots have tried to rush through that door to make shit coins has nothing to do with the underlying technology. Before Ethereum, people were making shitcoins using Bitcoin's technology. <laughs> Don't fool yourself. There will always be people who are unscrupulous and want to make shitcoins. The bottom line here is that I'm interested in technology, and I'm open to all different technologies and reading and learning about them, even if I don't agree with their governance models, even if I don't agree with the choices they've made about how to fork and how to uh, fix problems and fix bugs, even if I don't agree with the level of centralization or decentralization they have, because they're not alone in this space. They're competing against a variety of other technologies. And the technology of using virtual machines and consensus algorithms and blockchains to run smart contracts 
That technology exists independent of Vitalik Buterin's Ethereum, independent of any current implementation and whether that succeeds or fails, or has a big price or a low price, independent of whether these things compete or don't compete against Bitcoin, which, in my opinion, they don't. Um, that technology is interesting. There is a real technology there, and I'm interested in it. And if you think that I'm going to be faithful uh, to Bitcoin by limiting my intellectual curiosity, by refusing to read or learn about technologies that may, in some people's minds, threaten the supremacy of the one true doctrine. That's not science. That's religion. And I don't do religion. That's a litmus test. That's a loyalty test. That's a purity test. And I don't do any of that. I'm going to remain intellectually curious. If ideas threaten you, uh, then you need to learn more about them, not stop learning. Um, this is not a faith-based system. At least I hope it's not, and I, I'm not interested in faith-based systems. Does that mean that I'm no longer interested in Bitcoin? Absolutely not. I am absolutely interested in Bitcoin. I'm also interested in Ethereum. I'm also interested in half a dozen other chains, technologies, layers, and protocols, all swirling around this amazing cryptocurrency system. We are so focused on setting up the circular firing squads and litmus tests that we've forgotten what the real enemy of this is. And the real enemy is not the not quite decentralized system just across the road that other people use cryptocurrency technology to build. The real enemy is totalitarianism, fascism, corrupt crony capitalism, and destructive banking systems that are absolutely centralized, share none of our values, and are causing enormous damage to the world. Stop worrying about whether Ethereum is going to compete or isn't going to compete against Bitcoin. This entire cryptocurrency space is growing. You don't like Ethereum? That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Don't use it. It's an open market. Nobody's forcing you to use it. But the reason I am writing a book about this technology is first and foremost because I want to learn about all of the intricate details of how a virtual machine a blockchain, a consensus algorithm can be used to execute smart contracts. Not because I'm interested in one implementation of that, but because I'm interested in all of the possible implementations of that idea, because they provide a very broad and rich domain for experimentation. And you can do that with a variety of monetary policies. You can do it with a variety of governance policies. You can do it in centralized or decentralized uh, networks. Uh, you can do it across the board. So that's why I'm writing Mastering Ethereum. Um, I'm still very much interested, invested, and working on Bitcoin and other open blockchains every day. And I will continue to work on open blockchains, and I will continue to be curious and interested and playful with technology, so I can learn as much as I can about this new uh, technology. And if that makes me disloyal, that's okay. I don't mind. My question is: What if USA and EU ban exchanges like gambling sites and the period schemes, similar like China? So, what is the solution of that? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, what is the solution to pyramid schemes and the various Ponzi schemes that are occurring on a daily basis throughout this entire ecosystem of related cryptocurrencies? First of all, it's naive to think that pyramid schemes only happen in cryptocurrencies or in regulated markets, or even that regulation stops pyramid schemes. The word Ponzi comes from a fund created by George Ponzi in what was then a regulated market. Not as regulated as today, but a regulated market. If you get mad offed, that's because you were rich enough to be able to buy into the fund that was a Ponzi scheme for the rich in a thoroughly regulated market, and in fact ended up being one of the few people who went to jail because he committed the cardinal mistake of stealing from the rich. Do not do that. <laughs> you can defraud a million people out of their mortgages, but do not steal from the rich, because then you might actually end up in jail. Probably a very nice jail. You know, not the kind of jail that you'd send someone for smoking a joint. 
But how do we deal with pyramid schemes? How do we deal with Ponzi's? They happen, and they will continue to happen. And they'll happen in regulated markets and unregulated markets, and they'll happen more in unregulated markets. And the reason they happen more in unregulated markets is not because the regulators are stopping Ponzi schemes, but because they are restricting access to entrance on both sides of the market enough that it is very difficult to generate the type of liquidity needed for Ponzi schemes. I mean, you can list Herbalife on the stock exchanges. No one is touching that. But if you can appeal to a worldwide audience of investors, then you can really accelerate your pyramid scheme. Right? And as a result, that is exactly what is happening. There is only one way to stop investors from making stupid mistakes. They have to first make stupid mistakes, and lose money, and be more cautious, and make more stupid mistakes, and lose money, and be more cautious. You cannot teach someone who is making a return they have never seen in their life, that the reason they are making a return that they have never seen in their life from a website that says, guaranteed profits 10 percent a week, is because they are sitting on the upper levels of a pyramid that will surely, at some point, collapse, leaving 90 percent of the people with nothing. You cannot convince them. How do I know this? Because I try every day. If I call out a scam on Twitter, I am hailed as a hero. No, I'm not. I get viciously attacked by every participant in that pyramid scheme. How dare you side with the banks? I thought you were one of the good guys. How dare you call insert latest Ponzi here a scam? People used to say Bitcoin is a scam. When did you start taking money from the banks? People are extremely resistant to learn that lesson, and they will not learn it if you tell them what the lesson is. They will only learn it experientially, experiential learning. It's the latest in education. And the way that works with investors is they have to lose money. Why is it that Americans are less susceptible, for example, to pyramid schemes than your average Chinese investor? Be careful how you answer that question. Uh, <laughs> The reason is really simple. It's because Americans have been investing in pyramid schemes since the early 1900s. And they get burned again and again and again and this lesson starts getting passed down generationally. So the first time you come back from school and I remember this day where my fellow school members were playing a game called Egyptian Pyramid where they drew on the blackboard a big triangle, and they said, you are here, recruit two people each below you, and take your lunch money, and give half of it to the person above you. And then you recruit two people, and they recruit two people. And I looked at that, and I thought, this is amazing! We could all make so much money. In fact, half my friends are already buying lunch like they're kings. And I went home and I told my dad about this amazing new thing that I discovered at school, what they were teaching us, right? Uh, not the teachers, but everybody else. The Egyptian pyramid. And he sat me down and explained to me why it's a scam. And what happens when it ends, and how many of those kids are going to get into very serious trouble when the pyramid collapses. Why? Because he had been scammed with a pyramid in his youth. And his father had been scammed with a pyramid in his youth. And so we learn, and we tell our children. And the only way to learn that mistake is to lose money. The reason investors are more sophisticated in the United States, for example, or in many Western nations, is because they've had a hundred years of practice. Nothing else. There's nothing inherently better about the regulatory system. In fact, arguably, the Chinese regulatory system is far more effective. 
They actually shoot bankers, and then they bill their family for the bullet. They do. They execute hundreds of them. Now that's maybe a regulatory system I could get behind. No, okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. For a moment there, I forgot I'm a pacifist. But anyway, the point is, you cannot teach these skills unless you use experience. So, the biggest mistake you can make is teach investors that they do not need to make smart choices themselves. That if they make bad choices, they will get bailed out. That if they allow someone else to vet, authorize, rate, value the investment, if they outsource the decision-making, if they outsource the risk to someone else, everything is going to be okay. And of course, everything is not going to be okay, because giving that power to someone else immediately introduces corruption. So then the people who are rating, vetting, authorizing, and deciding which investments are safe are the people you need to corrupt in order to introduce your pyramid scheme. They also are not infallible. In fact, they cannot operate at the speed of the market because centralized decision making does not scale. Markets do. What you need to do instead is tell investors, caveat emptor, buyer beware. There are scams out there. We will not catch them until they've done enormous damage. You will lose your money. Be careful. The stock market is a pyramid scheme. The bond market is a pyramid scheme. The automobile loan market is a pyramid scheme. The student loan market is one of the biggest pyramid schemes we've ever built, and all of them are going to crash, as are many of the altcoins and ICOs. And the only way to help investors is to let them make that mistake, take full responsibility for that mistake, and lose all of the money that they put in. Yes, punish the people who did it afterwards, but you can't save people from their own stupidity. And when you try, you make them stupider. <laughs> Which do you think is a superior platform for smart contracts? Bitcoin with sidechains like Rootstock. Ethereum, or one of the self-proclaimed 3G or third-generation uh, blockchains. I mean, the problem is you can't really compare these things, uh, and the reason you can't compare them is because one exists and the other two are mostly um, roadmap or test software at the moment. So Ethereum exists. And you can like it, you can hate it, but you can actually express an opinion as to how good it is for smart contracts and what kind of problems it has and how those problems are being addressed by the developers and community in Ethereum. I think they've done um, okay so far. Some big mistakes, some great successes, and the platform is gradually and slowly maturing. Um, Rootstock, I'm interested in seeing how that goes. Until you have drive chains, Rootstock is a more centralized, federated model. Um, it would have to bootstrap some kind of uh, consensus algorithm that's a bit more decentralized, and it's still in the very early stages of testing. So promising, interesting, different, but not yet. And the third generation. Uh, blockchains um, are suffering from the fact that most of them are not able to differentiate sufficiently with the first generation blockchains uh, or second generation blockchains. And so they're babies with big ambitions. Um, when they grow up, we'll see uh, and judge according to scale. Do it at scale first. If, you, if you're not doing it at scale, you can't draw any conclusions. So first, you have to put a very big pot of money on the table and say, "Hey, I'm going to secure this with a smart contract. Let's see what happens." And sometimes, what happens is millions of dollars get stolen or locked into a contract accidentally. But that's how you learn. Um, that's how you find those bugs. So right now, the superior platform for smart contracts is really uh, the only platform that's kind of doing smart contracts at scale, which is Ethereum. Um, and whether it's superior or not, that's a whole other discussion. What makes Ethereum interesting to you? What would you say to someone who thinks it's nothing more than an educational example of how not to do smart contracts? Um, 
So when I say Ethereum, I think I'm speaking a bit more broadly than uh, the ETH token and blockchain. Um, I'm talking more about a um, uh, virtual machine-based Turing complete programmable blockchain that allows you to run smart contracts, which would encompass things like classic, rootstock, and possibly Lisk and a few others. <clears throat> I find them all interesting. I think the idea of a general purpose programmable blockchain where you can run uh, programs as uh, I hate the term smart contracts, honestly, but where you can run programs that are triggered by transactions and track the state. It's a difficult idea to execute on. It's going to take a long time to mature the security. Um, along the line, there are going to be a lot of mistakes and missteps and burnt money and crashes and security vulnerabilities. But I think in the long run, something useful can emerge from that. Um, there are some scaling issues, there are some security issues, but I think we'll see the maturity getting to the point where you can do interesting things. Interesting things that take the security flexibility trade-off that Bitcoin has made slightly into the flexibility side, uh, with, with still being able to maintain enough security to do some very interesting things that you cannot do. Um, with with Bitcoin, there are things that you can't do with with Bitcoin, um, and they're you know doing those securely is very very difficult, um, and we've seen that again and again with Ethereum. So Ethereum can't do what Bitcoin does, and I, I've talked about these trade offs before. And in fact, no Turing complete virtual machine based blockchain can do what Bitcoin does. Having a script language that is very simple and not churn complete and uh, very robust, I think is a very important differentiator. And it has certain very useful applications. So I find Ethereum interesting also as a platform for testing um, software engineering in the blockchain space on a much, much more rapid basis than Bitcoin. Bitcoin, because of its nature as a robust reserve currency and very, very secure decentralized payment platform, um, has to be conservative, and as a result, it has to move slowly, and it can take risks. Like there is no way that we could do proof of stake as an experiment on Bitcoin, and they're about to do it on Ethereum. Um, and I'm very interested in seeing how that experiment plays out, and if it's successful, it will open the door for a lot more interesting. Um, consensus algorithms and, and hybrid systems and interactions between blockchains and a, a great development in the state of the art and the science. So all of those things make Ethereum interesting. I'm interested because it can move faster. I'm interested because it explores a much broader set of applications. I'm interested because <clears throat> despite its missteps, it's actually taught us a lot of very useful lessons. We're learning a lot about governance as well. Um, and there are some very tricky questions about when do you fork, when do you not fork, who do you bail out, who do you not bail out, how important is immutability. All of these things are being experimented on because of Ethereum. I also like the fact that having other robust blockchains with strong valuations, liquidity, and lots of transactions aside from Bitcoin, um, makes the space healthier for everyone. Uh, when, when Bitcoin is having a bad time, it gives some people somewhere to diversify into that is not fiat. I mean, if I wanted to take my money out of uh, uh, Bitcoin, I'm not saying that's something I want to do. But at the moment, I might have two choices. I could diversify into dollars. I could have well, three choices. I could diversify into gold. And now I could also diversify into some of the other um, blockchains out there that are doing interesting things. Um, it's it's up to every person to evaluate what's interesting to them. Next question, Matt says, other than the scaling problem, what is the most challenging obstacle for Ethereum and Bitcoin moving forward? Oh, that's uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've said I think repeatedly that to me the biggest problem is privacy, and the reason privacy is a very big problem is uh, that if we don't have strong enough anonymity and privacy, the most obvious attack against these systems, when they get 
to a size where they start threatening the existing monetary uh, monetary control system, the big interests of banks and things like that, is that in countries where the rule of law is pretty weak, they're going to pass laws where they're going to punish you after the fact for things you do with digital currencies. Um, ex post facto laws, vague laws, laws that are uh, that create enormous prosecutorial discretion so they can make examples of some people, um, laws where you don't know if what you're doing is, is correct or not, but the penalties are extremely harsh, things like that. And all of those depend on the ability to find you and create consequences after you've done a transaction for that uh, transaction, right? So, um, so privacy, I think, is really important because privacy allows us to diffuse some of the legal attacks that are likely to come in the long term uh, and create a more robust network. Uh, I think that obstacle is more important than scaling, and it needs to be solved in the base layer because it can't be solved in the second layer. Rodney asks, Ethereum presale, ICO or no? Do you consider the Ethereum presale an ICO? If so, why? If not, why not? This topic has been hot recently due to SEC announcements about ICOs being securities. I'm curious to hear Andreas's thoughts on this situation too. Um, is the follow-up comment to that question? So I think Ethereum probably has one of the best arguments as to its role as a utility token rather than a security. Um, keep in mind, unlike many of the other fundraisers that have happened with various uh, startups, Ethereum isn't really a startup. It's not a company. There is no uh, company and there are no shares or equity or registration. There's a foundation, but that foundation is a Swiss nonprofit, and you certainly don't get shares in that foundation or in future profits. Ethereum also um, has a specific role as a platform, and that platform has been the platform for all of the other ICOs. So, um, the token Ether is um, a token that is meant to be used to pay for gas. That's the argument for Ethereum. The idea is that Ether is how you control the use of resources on the Ethereum platform for other applications, including ICOs. Ether pays for the network fees, the gas, for running smart contracts, for doing transactions on the Ethereum platform. Uh, I think Ether as a utility token and Ethereum as a utility platform is probably a fairly well-developed uh, argument and a robust argument. Uh, I don't really see uh, Ethereum's presale as an ICO. I think it is the most credible utility token out there in terms of it being utility rather than security. I'm not commenting on the value of it or its use as a currency or a speculative instrument. That's not um, my answer here. But simply comparing it between a security or utility token, I think the argument is uh, quite robust for it being a utility token. I would like to, to come uh, to come back to the uh, the intersection of the traditional financial industry and the yes, digital currency ecosystem, and it seems that the initial coin offering happening now yes. is the first instance where these two worlds have to coexist. Correct. Where we see some businesses that cannot access normal financing, get digital currency financing. What's your perspective on this trend? What's your, what's your view? Uh, who here has heard of the term ICO? Okay, ICO is basically the idea of creating a digital token that represents um, perhaps shares or something else that can be bought online through these digital currency platforms. It's a play on IPO, initial public offering. Um, except that it's not registered, not legal, completely global, completely open to all investors, and bypasses all of the regulations around funding, uh, which is causing a few minor headaches, or major headaches if you work for the SEC. 
Um, what's happening with the ICO space is it's opened up this entire gap between organic and angel investing, VC and stock markets, and it bridges all of that with this new model that allows any company anywhere to raise funds from any investor anyway. So connecting everyone in this massive new market. That has created an enormous surge of excitement, an enormous surge of money. Uh, I think the latest estimates are well into the $40, $50 billion raised in the last year uh, through these mechanisms. Um, it's drawing all kinds of sharks and worms and snake oil salespeople um, who are taking horrible advantage. And here's something that most people find hard reconciling in their minds, this idea that of the current batch of initial coin offerings, 99.99% are either outright scams or uh, indistinguishable from outright scams, and will fail miserably and return nothing. And simultaneously, ICOs are the most radical and impactful development in fundraising of the last hundred years. They will fundamentally transform fundraising worldwide. They will break down enormous barriers. They will create enormous liquidity and flexibility, and will make this an international market that fundamentally undermines the uh, Palo Alto VCs right up the ro road here. Um, it's a very interesting space. There will be a lot of tears. There will be a lot of burnt investors who will lose a lot of money, but that doesn't change the fact that in that process these offerings mature. What people fail to understand is that ICOs do not simply represent shares or share offerings. These tokens are a hybrid thing that is simultaneously a share. It can be a product reward. It can be a loyalty point or loyalty card. It can be a, an access token that gives you access to a product or service. It can be the currency by which you buy uh, uh, software as a service, uh, for example, storage or computing or other uh, resources and do resource allocation. It is a market index that represents uh, the companies that are playing in a space. It's a technology basket fund. All of these characteristics are in a single token that can play all of these roles. This is not just simply, hey, let's do a new form of shares, bypass the SEC, and create this orgy of funding. Although, at first glance, that's exactly what it looks like. Um, it is a very, very interesting technology that creates a completely new thing, this token. And this tokenization and monetization of resources that can be done with these tokens is very, very big. It's very, very interesting. And it's not just a free-for-all that it looks like right now. By the way, I haven't invested in any of those. Um, when I look at these ICOs, what do I look at? The same things I did when I was doing due diligence for VC firms. Team, plan, market, timing, right? product, all of those things. Um, and I look at all these ICOs and I go, no, 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 and hell no, and walk away. <laughs> so, uh, be very careful. Don't go playing into these markets thinking you're going to get rich quick. These are get poor quick schemes, uh, and uh, you will lose your money. As they say, what does it take to make a million dollars in this space? Start with two. Sidakar asks, how is gas used? Is it used only in Ethereum? This is a very interesting uh, question, Sudakar. And gas is a fascinating topic when it comes to Ethereum and other smart contracts-based platforms. So when you hear people talk about Ethereum, a term you're going to hear almost immediately is the term Turing complete. And when you hear Turing complete, it sounds like something that is a great feature to have. I mean, after all, if you're not Turing complete, that means you're Turing incomplete, and that sounds like you're missing something. Uh, in fact, it's not the case. A Turing-complete language, uh, such as the languages used in uh, the smart contracts uh, running on Ethereum or the Ethereum virtual machine, is one that can execute a program of arbitrary complexity. Usually, that means the programming language has the ability to run loops. In fact, it's very easy to make something Turing-complete. Even very, very simple systems are Turing complete. 
And in some cases, even systems that were not meant to be Turing complete become accidentally Turing complete and end up being far more flexible than originally thought. It's actually harder to make something Turing incomplete, meaning uh, preventing it from executing all kinds of arbitrary code and keeping it constrained. And part of the reason for all of this has to do with a proof uh, made by Alan Turing in 1936, which was the halting pro problem or um, Unscheidung's problem, where uh, Alan Turing proved that if you have a Turing complete system, you cannot predict whether that system will ever stop running or whether it will simply run forever. You also can't predict if it will follow a specific execution path or um, um, execute a specific part of the code. And this causes a significant problem, because uh, with a smart contract that is running in the Ethereum virtual machine, every single uh, Ethereum client that is participating on the network has to validate that program by running it. Now, how does it know how long that program will run? Can the Ethereum client predict how long a program will run, and whether it will consume a certain amount of resources? And what Turing proved back in 1936 is that you cannot predict that. And therefore, Ethereum doesn't have any way to know if a program based on some starting conditions, like a specific input from a transaction and the blockchain as it is at the time of execution, will run for a second, a thousand seconds, a million seconds, or infinity. Um, it doesn't know if it will execute one command, ten commands, a million commands, or infinity commands, never stopping and going into an infinite loop. So, if your Ethereum client has to run a program in order to validate it, how do you make sure that these programs do not consume all of the resources of all of the computers participating in Ethereum? Vitalik Buterin's solution to this was to make the language of Ethereum Turing complete, so as to give maximum flexibility, but then add a way to constrain it so that it didn't consume resources without end. And that mechanism is gas. So gas is a way of prepaying for a specific amount of execution or resources um, for every computer that will validate it. And every transaction in Ethereum provides an upper limit on the amount of gas that the execution will be able to consume. And when the smart contract is executed by the Ethereum virtual machine, the Ethereum virtual machine starts accounting for gas by essentially debiting an amount of gas for every instruction executed by the smart contract. And if during this process the smart contract runs out of the available gas in the transaction, it stops it. So it forces it to have an upper limit on how much execution, how much resource can be consumed by any smart contract. There's also a gas limit for every block, which ensures that no matter how many transactions are in a block, there is an upper limit on the maximum amount of computation and resources consumed to validate and execute that block. And so that's the role of gas. Gas is the solution to the problem introduced by the extra flexibility of a Turing complete language that, as a result, has no ability of predicting how long a program will run, and could create conditions where a single transaction takes forever to validate and locks up all of the processing of all of the computers participating in Ethereum. Winter Matiko asks, Andreas, can you please explain how can I, as a smart contract developer, be able to know how much the execution of my program will cost on the blockchain? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I have a difficult answer for you, and maybe you won't like this. It is not possible to guess how much gas uh, the execution of a contract can use. In fact, Turing proved that even long before. Uh, stored program computers existed, smart contracts and blockchains existed. Um, he proved that it is not possible to predict whether a certain execution path uh, will be executed by a program, other than running it. And in running it, you never know what is going to happen. So you can estimate the amount of gas that is used by a smart contract, but you can never predict it accurately because um, the conditions under which it runs may change between your estimate 
and what actually happens. Let me give you a, a silly, contrived example that, that shows how this works. Let's say I write a smart contract that has a counter in it. And, um, if uh, every time you, you call it with a transaction, it increases this counter. And the first 99 times you call it, all it does is 1 plus 1 equals 2. It does a simple addition. And that's going to cost a certain amount of gas. Let's say that costs 400 units of gas to run. It's a simple addition. But it looks, in that contract, it looks at how many times it's been called, and on the hundredth time it decides to do something else. On the hundredth time it decides to run a hash function a million times. Now that's going to cost you, I don't know, let's say five million gas. So the difference between the 99 times you run this contract and it only consumes 500 gas, and the hundredth time you run the contract when it consumes 5 million gas, is simply the order of transactions. And it's very simple to create um, contracts like that. It's also very simple to accidentally create contracts, where the amount of gas that's used varies considerably between one execution and the next, based on circumstances that you can't predict. Um, let's say, for example, that you estimate um, the amount of gas that's going to be used to call this contract, and your software estimates this based on you being the 98th transaction in a row. And as you transmit your transaction, two other transactions first call that contract. And that means your transaction is now the 100th transaction in a row. And instead of costing 500 gas, it costs 5 million gas to run your transaction. And so you can't predict how the conditions will change. Um, until you actually run your transaction and it's included in the block, because the transaction just before yours may change the state of the contract in such a way as to cause it to follow a completely different execution path, to call other contracts, who knows what they're going to do, and to use gas in a completely unpredictable way. Um, so this is one of the challenges with writing smart contracts, and actually the ability to have the contract pay for the gas. Um, gives us a bit more flexibility in how to plan uh, gas expenditure and estimates for smart contract developers. Sudakar asks, is a smart contract legally accepted? What happens if one party defaults? That's a really great question. I think the word smart contract is very confusing for most people. What is a smart contract? Well, it's not smart. And it's not a contract. A smart contract is a dumb program. A smart contract is a program written in a language that is executed inside a blockchain-based virtual machine. It's a program, and they're not particularly smart. Um, they're fairly, fairly unsophisticated software programs. The important part being that they manage money. Now, could they have legal implications? Could they be legally binding? Perhaps, perhaps, uh, especially if combined with some kind of uh, written legal contract. Um, but there are many jurisdictions in which various forms of agreement, whether written or not, are considered legally binding. So there is no reason why a smart contract uh, could not be legally binding. However. This depends on the jurisdiction, and it also depends on what the legal precedents are. And until there is more established case law in this case, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just giving you my opinion on this. Until there's more established uh, casework on this, the term smart contract is very, very loosely used and should not be considered a contract. So for the second part of your question, what happens if one party defaults? Well, if the smart contract handles that particular case in its program, uh, then something happens. Something happens on the blockchain. Is that legally binding or not? I don't know. That's a question you have to ask a lawyer. Um, and this is the really interesting thing: that this is not a matter of law. Smart contracts are not a legal construct. They are a software construct. They do things on blockchains. Whether those things are within the law or accepted by the law or recognized by the law has nothing to do with how the smart contract works. Katarina asks. How is a token singled out and designated to represent, for example, ownership of a house? I can decide that one particular token will represent ownership and then code that into the token. Can you explain how this works? 
Well, Katerina, usually the way this works is you have some kind of external data store. And this could be something like a decentralized file store like IPFS or uh, Ethereum Swarm. And you would store some PDF document, for example, the deed of the house or some other title, or a reference to a title registry, such as a municipal, state or uh, government registry of titles. And you could take all of that information and encode it into a token. Now, the real question is, if you transfer that token to someone else, does that also transfer the title? In most jurisdictions, no. Um, what a lot of people are trying to do is get laws passed that recognize the transfer of ownership of the asset, the house, um, when the token that contains the title or hash of the title is transferred. So that's a bit harder, really. This is the difference between software and law. Um, just because you can transfer a token in software doesn't mean that you can then take that token ownership to uh, your local planning office and say, "Hey, I own this land, I own this house," and have that legally recognized. That's one leap further down. Rule asks, "Where are Ethereum transactions stored?" after executing the contract code? That's a really great question, Rule. So Ethereum transactions are stored on the blockchain the same way that Bitcoin transactions are stored on the blockchain. The difference is that where Bitcoin transactions track the state of ownership of uh, specific coins, or um, unspent transaction outputs, as they're called, in Ethereum, the transactions uh, may trigger Contract, uh, smart contract execution, and that can modify the state of a contract or the state of an account within Ethereum. So Ethereum transactions track or cause changes or state transitions in uh, any form of state that could be data within a contract or the balance of an account. A much broader set of state. What's actually stored in the Ethereum blockchain are two things. The first thing is uh, the transaction itself. And the second thing is the transaction logs, or receipts as they are called, which show what changes this transaction caused to the global state. The contract execution itself isn't stored on the blockchain. So you store what started the contract, and you store what state changes happened because of the execution of the contract, but the execution of the contract itself is not stored on the blockchain. You essentially store the inputs. Uh, of contracts, which are transactions, and the outputs of contracts, which are state changes. Um, those are the two things that are stored on the Ethereum blockchain. And so anyone can validate this information by um, taking that same transaction that's stored on the blockchain, uh, playing it through the smart contract execution by running it on the Ethereum virtual machine, and then looking at the output of the Ethereum virtual machine, the logs, and seeing what state transitions occurred uh, during the execution of the smart contract, and what state changes occurred, and comparing those with the receipts or logs that are stored in the Ethereum blockchain. Every single validating node on Ethereum should arrive at exactly the same answer. The same transaction should cause the same state changes and produce the same receipts and logs. And that's how Ethereum validation is done. Kirili asks, is there enough being done to confirm that smart contracts will work in the way that people have envisioned they will work? Um, Kirili, I mean, the problem here is that the vision is far more expansive than what can currently be done with smart contracts. So um, people envision all kinds of things. Whether you can do all of those all kinds of things is a whole other question. And I think people sometimes go way too far in coming up with these crazy ideas um, to replace things, even things that currently work, um, with smart contracts. The term smart contracts is beginning to become as vague and full of bullshit as the term blockchain or the term AI. Uh, it doesn't really mean what most people think it means. Simon asks, uh, do you think it's possible to combine smart contracts with AI and machine learning? Maybe uh, in very small ways, but not in any practical way and not anytime soon. 
These are both very mature, very new technologies. And when I say both, I mean smart contracts and um, AI and machine learning. And while they're progressing really, really fast, uh, they're not necessarily easy to combine. So, what happens if you take smart contracts and combine it with AI? Well, now you took all of the risks and problems of one immature technology, and you multiplied them by all of the risks and problems of another immature technology. It makes for a fantastic marketing brochure, and you'll probably raise a lot of venture capital uh, money from, from investors who don't really understand what AI or smart contracts are, uh, and are very impressed by these buzzwords. But the truth is that in practice, doing anything that involves two experimental technologies uh, increases your risks exponentially. And I don't expect we're going to see any useful or practical or relevant, interesting applications combining AI and smart contracts in the next uh, several years, perhaps even decade. Kirley also asks, what should be done when things go wrong with smart contracts? i.e. where funds are lost due to coding errors and bugs? This is a really great question. In fact, it is the basis of a giant debate happening primarily in Ethereum right now, which started with the DAO bug, the decentralized autonomous organization that had a massive bug leading to the loss of $155 million. And in the end, um, the Ethereum community decided to revert that transaction. But in the process of doing that, split the Ethereum community into two, and now there is also Ethereum Classic, which is the part of Ethereum that refused to reverse that transaction. And this is likely to keep happening. So um, there is an ongoing debate as to what to do when funds are lost due to coding errors and bugs. On the one hand, um, people might think that this is a way to protect users, but unfortunately. Um, who gets to make these decisions? And when you vest power in someone to make these decisions as to when funds can be reversed, not only does that power become dangerous, but the people who have that power are now liable. Uh, what happens when a government comes and asks them to reverse a transaction? They can't say, we can't do it, because they've already done it. So, um, these are very dangerous and difficult decisions. Um, the opposing argument really, is that uh, reversing things that were lost due to coding errors and bugs creates what is known as moral hazard. And moral hazard is a particular economic condition where people take uh, more risks than they would otherwise take, because they know that they will get bailed out. Um, we find moral hazard in areas such as insurance, and banking, and um, stock trading. So when people know that somebody else will assume the risk, or they think that somebody else will assume the risk, they take on more risk. Um, and as a result, uh, that leads to more coding errors and bugs. If you knew that if a smart contract has a bug and you lose money, you're never getting it back, would you be more careful with auditing and selecting and very carefully putting small amounts before you put medium amounts before you put huge amounts of money on top of a smart contract and conversely if you knew that if something went wrong you'd simply get bailed out would you be more reckless with the use of smart contracts this is one of the things that is at the heart of this debate, and it's not resolved um, there will be different blockchains that choose different policies as to how to solve this Simon asks, regarding Ethereum, what if there is a bug in the initial program running on all of these different machines? Is there a way to correct the code in the contract, or is it forever flawed? Uh, Simon, you've, uh, you've picked up on something that is a fundamental design consideration when designing smart contracts. <clears throat> Smart contracts are recorded on a blockchain, and they represent a fundamentally different development process. Because once you create a smart contract and encode it on the blockchain, its code cannot change. It is immutable. It will forever run that way. This creates quite a problem, because if you have a bug, that means that, that bug will be there forever. You cannot modify that contract after it has been created. Now, there are a few ways to get around that. One way to get around that is um, to essentially um, create a process where you can migrate from one contract to another, to another, to another, so that um, you, you essentially move all of the data, all of the tokens, all of the owners, all of the 
uh, information that's stored within the contract to a new version of that contract that you deploy in the blockchain, and then you kill the old one. Um, however, this isn't so easy to do either, because if you can migrate all of the data, um, all of the ownership information, and all of that to a new contract, that means ultimately that the developers who deploy this contract have to retain control over it. Uh, which means it's not very autonomous uh, and it's not very decentralized because you have centralized control and the developers have to retain that control in order to be able to upgrade it. Um, you have some potential issues there. Uh, that also means, of course, that there is a whole other class of bugs that can exist in the upgrade code. Specifically, uh, if you look, for, uh, for example, at the DAO, uh, which is one of the most famous uh, vulnerabilities in the Ethereum space, the DAO had a bug in the code that was meant to split the DAO, so that people could fork off, potentially upgrade, and change the code. Uh, so there's a potential that the code that checks who the owner is and allows you to upgrade and migrate to a new contract itself can have bugs, and that's a whole other category of bugs. So this is one of the problems, not problems, it's one of the differences between developing software in a traditional centralized um, uh, code release, uh, code test release, um, and version upgrade mechanism, a classic software development methodology, and the methodology you have to use with um, smart contracts on a blockchain, where you don't have uh, an opportunity always to fix mistakes from the past, or where uh, creating the opportunity to fix mistakes is in itself quite complicated. Camilo says. What is your opinion on smart contract developers as the new gateway, gatekeeper, middleman, intermediaries? So I'm going to just paraphrase that a tiny bit. So the idea here is that in a system like uh, Ethereum that uh, supports smart contracts, but this would equally apply to uh, Rootstock or Cardano or any of the other or EOS or any of the other smart contract platforms that have a virtual machine. Uh, while, while the consensus rules establish that a smart contract will be executed exactly as written, and you can protect uh, those consensus rules through decentralization, that still allows smart contract developers to write smart contracts that are not decentralized. In fact, one of the questions we'll uh, talk about in a bit uh, addresses that specific issue and how it can be a vulnerability. So the question was, doesn't that just make smart contract developers the new gatekeepers because they can write smart contracts that are not decentralized? They can write smart contracts that give them powers. Uh, they can write smart contracts that have a certain set of rules, and those rules are not subject to consensus. Only the fact that they will be executed correctly. Um, I, I think part of the issue here is the idea that just because a system has a set of rules, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, write. Uh, something, contracts, transactions, whatever, to reconcentrate power in a centralized way. I mean, the internet is, uh, is a decentralized communications protocol, but it does allow the emergence of centralized companies on top of it, which is uh, essentially a function of economics, not uh, a function of the underlying protocol. So you, know, you have a completely open peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol, and on top of that, people build things like Facebook. Um, Similarly, uh, it, Bitcoin is a decentralized currency, but that doesn't stop someone from creating uh, a centralized exchange, a custodial exchange, and saying, I'll hold all of your keys, don't worry, or creating a centralized payment processor that says, I'll receive all of the transaction, hold all of the Bitcoin, and give you fiat in return, or um, have uh, a custodial wallet for users, or all of the other things that we've seen, all of these centralized forces, or more recently, build a centralized exchange-traded fund, uh, which is a custodial Bitcoin fund on behalf of other people. So just because the underlying cryptocurrency is decentralized doesn't mean that people can't build centralized things on top of it. The trick is that people can build centralized and decentralized things, 
And then hopefully the market gets to choose which ones to use so that they get the things that they want. If what they want is convenience and wealth, they'll choose the centralized things that are going to be more efficient at delivering, uh, at least for the short term, the convenience they want at the expense of privacy. If they understand the principles of decentralization, maybe they'll choose a decentralized application. You can go on the internet and you can use Facebook if you're an idiot, or you can use something that preserves your privacy and gives you choices and is much more decentralized. You can go on Bitcoin and you can use a custodial exchange to store all of your money. And that's not a very good choice, but you can. And the same thing applies to Ethereum smart contracts. Just because someone writes a smart contract doesn't make you use it. And just because someone has set the rules for their Ethereum-based social media network, or their Ethereum-based decentralized exchange, which isn't quite decentralized, or their Ethereum-based uh, smart contracts for loans, doesn't mean you have to use that one. If you use that one, you are making a choice, a market choice, that says, I want to use the rules that they have created. But on the very same Ethereum network, you can choose to use a smart contract that doesn't have backdoor ownership and controls for a centralized entity. You can choose to use a smart contract for social media, for posting, for loans, for decentralized exchanges. That is truly decentralized. Um, so the choice is yours. Now, are they gatekeepers? Gatekeepers have to have an advantage over other participants in the economy. Gatekeepers, generally speaking, have a government license, a regulated monopoly, uh, the ability to control the rules by which people play the game. And in decentralized currencies, decentralized smart contracts, decentralized protocols, the gatekeepers don't have special powers. They don't have the ability to force a monopoly, to get special uh, access, to get special privileges, to get preferential treatment, to get rent-seeking behavior. So if someone writes a shitty smart contract on Ethereum, don't run it. They don't have an advantage over anybody else running a smart contract. So the developers of smart contracts are not the new gatekeepers and middlemen because they don't have any special powers. They have to compete. Their smart contracts have to compete for your choices against all of the other smart contracts that are being deployed. Now, people make poor choices, but it's their choice to make. Um, and the the developers don't have any preferential access to Ethereum. So I don't think there is the new uh, middleman for Ethereum. On a decentralized platform, you can write both centralized and decentralized application, and it's up to the market to choose which ones they want to use. Anita has another question, and this is about the Bancor hack and security issues with ERC20 tokens in general. And this is an Ethereum question. Can you please explain what happened during the bank war hack some days ago? What are ERC tokens and how secure are they, given the bank war was not the first smart token issue that was hacked? Are there many smart contract hacks to come? Uh, and is Ethereum, simply put, less secure than Bitcoin? So, um, to start that explanation, on July 9th, uh, one of the big uh, exchanges that is a decentralized exchange, or claims to be a decentralized exchange in the Ethereum space, called Bancor, B-A-N-C-O-R, um, got hacked and lost uh, somewhere around $23.5 million in a combination of stolen Ether and uh, the, the Bancor network token, or BNT, I believe it's called, which was their own uh, token. So the way the hack happened was that Bancor was running smart contracts that allowed users to operate a decentralized exchange where they controlled their own money and they were able to exchange it with other people through smart contracts without an intermediary. However, these smart contracts had within them a let's call it a super user or a privileged user. They had a privileged account that allowed Bancor to uh, to change things, to restrict transactions, or uh, stop the flow of money, uh, or take money from wallets. Uh, from what I understand, and I may have this wrong, so bear with me, but from what I understand, they had effectively a super user within their smart contract that allowed them to intervene in the case of a problem. Now, we've seen this kind of formulation before, and as I, I mentioned in an answer to a previous question, 
smart contracts on a decentralized platform can be written in a centralized manner or a decentralized manner, and you choose which one to do. Um, the DAO, the DAO, um, was partially decentralized, but still had some curators. However, those curators didn't have enough power to stop the hack. So when it did get hacked, um, there was no one who could undo that hack. Um, and that's a double-edged sword. If you make it completely decentralized, but there's a problem, uh, then no one can fix that problem. But if you make it a bit centralized so that someone can fix the problem, sometimes that is the problem. In the case of Bancor, what they did was, I believe, they added a centralized wallet that could control some of the functions of the decentralized exchange so that they could intervene in the case of a problem. However, when that centralized wallet got compromised, it was able to drain money from the decentralized exchange, something that wouldn't happen if it was truly decentralized exchange or fully decentralized exchange. Bancor said that uh, centralization and decentralization are a spectrum, and uh, you can be decentralized even if you have some centralized functions. And that is absolutely true. Uh, however, in this case, the centralized functions were uh, the weak part of the system, as they usually are. If you have a system which has some centralized functions, those are going to be the primary target of attackers, um, because obviously they can exert greater control over the decentralized system. Um, in the second question, from in the second part of the question, I need to ask: What are ERC tokens, and how secure are they? Given that Bancor was not the first smart token issuer that was hacked, that's a great question. So. Um, you may have heard this term called ERC, and specifically ERC-20. ERC doesn't mean tokens. Uh, ERC is an Ethereum request for comment, uh, and it is a precursor to an EIP, which is an Ethereum improvement proposal. Very much like in Bitcoin, where you have Bitcoin improvement proposals, or BIPs, uh, ERC, uh, Ethereum has EIPs and EIPs. Um, EIPs and their precursor, which are ERCs, are basically just discussions on standards. And eventually, one of these discussions becomes a standard that is either uh, de facto adopted by the community or, through enough votes, uh, becomes uh, an official standard, if you like, of Ethereum. Um, ERC-20 was one uh, proposed uh, standard for how to do a transferable uh, token that can be named and have a specific amount of tokens as its initial supply, and can be issued by an issuer, and uh, have a, a token symbol, and all of these things, and can be transferred from owner to owner. Um, a lot of tokens were created with various smart contracts from the very beginning of Ethereum. However, each of the tokens used a slightly different way of doing things because it used its own smart contract. ERC-20 was the first attempt um, to standardize uh, the interface to the token smart contract, so that if you were an exchange or a wallet, uh, you could support any token that followed the ERC interface standard. And to do a, a transfer of a token, you'd use the same function with the same parameters. If you wanted to check what the supply or how many decimal digits or what the token name or what the token symbol is, you use the same functions. They exist. So for a token to be ERC20 compatible means that it supports the five or six uh, functions and variables of the ERC20 standard. It's very small. You can read it quite easily, uh, and you can find it online. And once it supports those, that means that any wallet or exchange can interact with that token in a, in a very standard way uh, and use that token. Now, really important point. If something is an ERC20 token, that is a minimalist description of its function, meaning that as an ERC20 token, it has at least the five or so variables and functions of the ERC20 specification and does support those. But it can have other functions in addition to that. A basic ERC token has only that. And that smart contract is actually secure. Um, it's been very well tested. So far, um, 
we haven't seen too many significant problems. There's a few conditions under which you can accidentally transfer ERC tokens to a contract that doesn't expect to receive them and have them locked uh, forever in that contract. There's a little problem with, with some of the ways you do transfers if you're not careful. But the ERC token standard itself, at the minimalist level, um, has not been hacked. If you take the ERC20 token and then add a function that says, um, and here is the special super owner, and then you add another function that says, and the super owner can do a transfer even if they're not the authorized user of the token, um, then you have something that is still ERC20 compatible, um, but has an element of centralization in it. And that may have a bug in the extra functions you added. And so just because something is ERC20 compatible doesn't mean it's secure. Uh, the minimalist specification is. But if you go adding things for every line you add, the number of bugs increases uh, exponentially. So how many more smart contracts hacks will happen? Uh, many. Uh, Ethereum is a system that evolves its maturity by putting code out there, creating a bounty effectively behind these smart contracts, and then having people find bugs and exploit it. It's a system that is designed to uh, have a lot more iterations in its functionality than Bitcoin, move a lot faster, even if that means breaking some things in the process, and is much more experimental. Uh, as a result, it has a lot more security vulnerabilities than Bitcoin. Practically speaking, Ethereum is less secure than Bitcoin. That doesn't mean it's not secure. It just means that you need to be very careful about which contracts you use and which you don't. There are some smart contracts that at this point have significant maturity. Um, but what does significant maturity mean in a currency that is three and a half years old? Uh, and we have to have that in perspective. So that would be equivalent to Bitcoin in 2012. And Bitcoin still had some rather significant bugs and weaknesses in 2012. So um, can Ethereum mature to be very secure, at least in terms of a subset of well-matured, well-used smart contracts that are very useful? I believe it can. Uh, will it take longer than Bitcoin? Yeah, probably. And uh, on the whole, there are more things to be worried about in terms of security vulnerabilities in Ethereum, because it has a lot of flexibility. And a lot of flexibility is a double-edged sword. It means that you can do very interesting and innovative things with smart contracts, but it also means there is a lot more opportunity for vulnerabilities, mistakes, and security flaws. Um, and so that's an engineering trade-off. You decide, do I want more flexibility if it means less security and robustness in the short term, or do I want less flexibility and have much more security and robustness? Bitcoin answered that engineering trade-off one way. Ethereum is answering that engineering trade-off another way. We're going to see how it plays out. Is a colored coin a meta coin? So, Albert, um, the term meta coin, I think, has only been used by me. Uh, I, I coined the term, if you like, uh, back in 2014 when writing Mastering Bitcoin First Edition. And I wanted to differentiate between coins that have their own blockchain, uh, coins that um, are, were called altcoins at the time, and coins that use metadata on top of another blockchain. Nowadays, that term I don't think is that useful because that distinction is a bit blurred. So, coins that use metadata on top of an existing blockchain, colored coins are, according to my definition, meta coins. They do not have their own blockchain. They use metadata in order to exist on top of another blockchain. In the particular case of colored coins, that usually refers to the Bitcoin blockchain. But nowadays, we have all of these tokens. And um, tokens could in some ways be considered metacoins, because they are metadata on top of Ethereum. Um, but then again, not really metadata. They are full smart contracts. So that definition is a bit blurry nowadays. Let's go to the second question. Albert asks, 
How would the color coin appear on a blockchain? Can a transaction involve the color coin be distinguished from an ordinary transaction? Yes, Albert, it can. On the blockchain, what you will see is within the transaction that refers to a color coin, there will be some additional data in the form of an op return code. And what the op return code does is it is a non-spendable output that contains up to 80 bytes of data. And these 80 bytes usually have some kind of signature, some, sorry, some kind of prefix that identifies which protocol um, they're using. So, uh, for example, if it's uh, a certain type of colored coin, like the implementation from Kolu, or the um, open assets implementation of colored coins, then the first two characters will actually identify it as such. If the transaction is part of some kind of secondary layer, like Counterparty or Omni, again, the op return will contain a prefix that identifies it as an Omni um, metadata or as Counterparty metadata. And so, as a result, you can identify colored coins and transactions happening on secondary layers like uh, Counterparty and Omni on the blockchain. Vikas asks a similar question. In regards to colored coins, how is a Genesis transaction created? Is the Genesis transaction part of the Genesis block? No, it is not. Uh, Vikas. A Genesis transaction is a transaction on Bitcoin that has within it an op return. And that op return identifies that a new colored coin has been created. And the op return itself would have some kind of prefix identifying which colored coin protocol is being used. And would color the specific coins in that transaction um, with the, the new metadata for this new form of colored coin that is just being created. So the fact that it's called a Genesis transaction is a bit confusing. I agree with you because we use the term Genesis to mean something else in Bitcoin. Uh, it's the genesis of that colored coin. And again, Genesis is simply the Greek word for birth. So it's the transaction that gives birth to that colored coin. Sudakar asks, what is the difference between coins and tokens? Can this be defined in layman terms? What a great question, Sudakar. I have been wanting to talk about this for a while, because people use these terms interchangeably. I think a good definition is this. A coin has its own blockchain. A token does not. A token usually is implemented on top of a coin. So, for example, um, the various tokens that are used in Counterparty and Omni and Colored Coins, those are all tokens, and they work on top of Bitcoin, which is a coin with its own blockchain. Um, all of the ERC-20 tokens and other standardized tokens, uh, ERC-721 tokens, etc., that exist in Ethereum, those are all tokens. They don't have their own blockchain. They operate on top of the Ethereum blockchain. So people use these terms interchangeably, and it's very, very confusing for most new users. I think one way to remove the ambiguity a bit, and it's not a perfect rule, and it will probably get violated, is to call things that have their own blockchain coins, and to call things that do not have their own blockchain but operate on top of another blockchain as a smart contract or secondary layer tokens. Isa asks. Can anyone create their own coins using Ethereum? Uh, yes, you can create your own, and those are called tokens. In last week's uh, class, we talked about the difference between coins and tokens. And while this isn't a broadly accepted definition, I use it for convenience. Coins are things that have their own blockchain. Tokens are things, are abstractions that run on top of another blockchain. So ERC20 tokens or Ethereum tokens are abstractions that run on top of the Ethereum system, which has its own coin called Ether, which runs on its own blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, similarly, you could have Bitcoin with its own uh, coin, which is Bitcoin, which runs on its own blockchain, Bitcoin. But it also has the ability to run tokens, uh, such as those built using Counterparty or Omni. And those are not coins. They don't have their own blockchain. Aisa asks a follow-up question. How was Ripple and Litecoin created? So both Ripple and Litecoin have their own blockchain, so they are independent 
uh, coins. They're not tokens running on top of another blockchain, and they have a very different path. Uh, Litecoin is based uh, primarily on Bitcoin's code base. So Litecoin is a slight modification of Bitcoin's code base and has been following the development of Bitcoin very, very closely. It's meant to be a lighter, faster version of uh, Bitcoin, exploring some different trade-offs between scalability, security, and centralization. But it still maintains more than 99% the same code base as uh, Bitcoin and keeps upgrading accordingly. Ripple, on the other hand, is a completely separate code base. It has nothing to do with the code in Bitcoin. It has a different model for implementing its um, network. It has a different model for validation of transactions. Um, it uses a federated model uh, instead of a blockchain. And it has different properties for security, decentralization, and um, scalability. Richard is asking a slightly cheeky question. Do you think building smart contract functionality on Bitcoin can make Vitalik blush? Um, and the full question is, the ERC-20 standard for creating tokens has been hugely successful, driving many individuals and businesses to Ethereum. Are you aware of any smart contract protocols allowing the creation of tokens that can be secured to Bitcoin's blockchain? More precisely, now that the Lightning Network layer is taking roots, could this be built upon to offer decentralized, permissionless token issuance, combining Bitcoin's ultra-high security with Lightning's ultra-low transaction smart contract execution costs? Um, so, Richard, first of all, um, I, I don't think Vitalik's going to blush if Bitcoin does smart contracts, uh, because as I've said many times in the past, I don't think that Ethereum and Bitcoin are competing directly, nor do I think that they can compete directly, because the flexibility that exists in Ethereum makes it less suitable for doing the robust reserve currency functions uh, of Bitcoin, and the robust reserve currency functions of Bitcoin make it less suitable for doing the flexible smart contracts of Ethereum. You can't get both. Now, I know you're going to hear a lot of people tell you, you can absolutely get both. Bitcoin maximalists will tell you, Bitcoin can do everything that Ethereum can do, only better. Ethereum maximalists will tell you, Ethereum can do everything Bitcoin can do. In fact, every other chain can do, only better. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think there are, in practice, engineering trade-offs that have to be made where you can't get everything. When I used to be a consultant, I used to tell my clients, you can get best, you can get fast, or you can get cheap. You pick two of those. So of the best, fast, and cheap, you only get to pick two. It's either going to be cheap and fast, and it's not going to be my best work. It's going to be best and fast, and it's not going to be cheap. Or it's going to be cheap and best, and it's going to take a long time to do. Those are the options. In computer science and in other terms, we call that a trilemma. It's like a dilemma, only with three. A trilemma, in which you can only pick two. Blockchains have a lot of trilemmas in them. and These trilemmas are optimizations, security, scalability, privacy. Pick two flexibility for smart contracts, immutability of the chain, robust finality on the consensus algorithm. Pick two. Generally, these become the trilemmas that we have to optimize for. So, there are companies trying to find a way to reconcile some of these and optimize for different points in that trilemma. And you can fudge a bit and move a bit in more direction, move a bit in the other direction, but you're not really removing the trade-off. In fact, I actually like systems that explicitly take a position on this trilemma and don't try to do everything. The systems that try to do everything suck at everything. The systems that have a specific philosophy. Bitcoin isn't trying to do very flexible, very complicated smart contracts because that comes at a security cost. And Ethereum isn't trying to work conservatively and slowly because moving fast and breaking things and innovating as quickly as possible 
to do flexible smart contracts is absolutely the sweet spot for that blockchain. And we can go into analysis of other blockchains and look at the various optimizations they do. We used to have um, ICO capable, ERC token like tokenization uh, systems in Bitcoin before Ethereum came along. And Bitcoin did this. It did it with Counterparty, which is a second layer protocol using the op return uh, data parameter in the Bitcoin script to track metadata, colored coins. Um, we had and have still the Omni protocol layer. Counterparty and Omni still exist on Bitcoin. You can still do ICOs and tokens and coins and all of that stuff. Um, and of course, there's RSK, which is trying to build a side chain or drive chain in this particular case um, that works in parallel with with Bitcoin, where you have smart contracts that are pegged to the Bitcoin currency and use uh, part of the Bitcoin security model. Again, these are different optimizations. The market is already telling us that they would rather take the flexibility of Ethereum. And quite honestly, that's a bit of a double-edged sword, um, because yes, you get all of the ICOs, but you also get all of the scam ICOs. So, do we really want that to come back to Bitcoin? If you look at the history in 2012, um, ICOs and new coins and these kind of ventures were being done with alt chains. So people built entire blockchains by forking the Bitcoin code. Uh, and that's what you saw the early coins, right? Some of them made sense, some of them didn't, most of them didn't. Then we had the second layer stuff in 2013 and 2014. We had Counterparty and Omni, and we saw a lot of initial coin offerings on those. ICOs were not invented by Ethereum. Bitcoin was doing them for two years before Ethereum came on the scene. And then finally, Ethereum made that so easy to do that any programmer with basic JavaScript experience can code probably an insecure uh, token and make a mess. And so that's what's happened. I don't know that we want that in Bitcoin, because that just dilutes the value proposition of Bitcoin. It's an interesting proposition. What, what Rootstock is doing is an interesting proposition, but we'll see how that plays out. Sudakar asks, what will Metropolis mean for Ethereum? Uh, great question, Sudakar. So Metropolis is the third out of the four uh, planned transitions for Ethereum. Ethereum was deployed in a manner that expects that there will be certain major transitions uh, between different stages of development. The first, uh, the first stage of development for Ethereum was called Frontier. And Frontier was uh, the stage of development that involved the pre-sale of uh, Ethereum, and um, the first, essentially, uh, pre-beta version of Ethereum that ran on the network. The current version of Ethereum, or the current stage of Ethereum that we're running today, is called Homestead. Homestead is planned to end um, in the next year, and will transition to the third stage of Ethereum called Metropolis. Uh, it's also predicted and named in advance that the final stage of Ethereum, which will be the um, stage that Ethereum settles in, if you like, will be called Serenity. So, Frontier, Homestead, Metropolis, and Serenity are the four evolutionary stages of Ethereum. Metropolis was actually planned for 2017 or perhaps the end of 2016, but because of the DAO incident, uh, the fork to Classic, uh, several denial of service attacks, and other problems that occurred during Homestead. Instead, the developers were delayed and distracted, uh, fixing security problems and doing a number of hard forks to address certain vulnerabilities discovered in Homestead. Um, as a result, Metropolis has been delayed, but it is expected in 2018, and, and it is moving pretty fast now. Metropolis introduces uh, a number of different change, changes uh, to Ethereum, and it's going to happen in two stages, which are codenamed Byzantium and Constantinople. Uh, Byzantium is the first stage of Metropolis, and Constantinople is the second stage of Metropolis. Each of those will be a hard fork, or perhaps uh, more than one hard fork, that will introduce a number of uh, changes into the Ethereum system.
Uh, a couple of big things that are happening, um, specifically for Byzantium, which is stage one of Metropolis, are the, introdu the introduction of zk snarks, uh, which allows Ethereum to be able to use the technology introduced by Zcash uh, to do uh, zero knowledge transactions for very very high levels of confidentiality and privacy. Um, zk snarks and native execution of zk snarks has been a goal of Vitalik Buterin for a while now. And it will be introduced with Byzantium. The other very big change uh, with, uh, introduced with the first stage of Metropolis is the uh, move towards proof of stake. So today, uh, Ethereum operates using a proof of work, a mining algorithm uh, called ET hash or ETH hash. Uh, ETH hash is. Um, is a uh, mining protocol that uses ha hashing with the SHA-3 Ketchak-256 algorithm, similar to how uh, Bitcoin does uh, mining with SHA-256, with a few changes that make it a bit more memory-intensive to prevent the easy development of ASICs. Um, in the first stage of Metropolis Byzantium, a new mechanism will be introduced, which is uh, proof of stake. And proof of stake will be using a protocol called Casper. Uh, proof of stake is different from proof of work in that it allows validation of transactions without mining, instead using validators who um, stake or um, bet an amount of ether in the validation of a block. And if they validate a block that is broadly accepted by the network, they receive a small reward in proportion to the amount of stake that they bet. On the validation of that block. And if they approve a block that the rest of the network rejects, then they lose their stake. And so this mechanism of reward and punishment is different than the mechanism of mining that requires computation with repeated hashing, and is going to be introduced with Byzantium. Um, Ethereum is not going to move directly to proof of stake. Instead, in the first stage, it's going to move to a hybrid environment where it uses proof of work and proof of stake simultaneously. Another big change that's coming with Byzantium is the diffusing of the difficulty bomb. Ethereum had a planned um, system within it called the difficulty bomb that was intended to force the developers to move to proof of stake by making it increasingly difficult to mine using proof of work. That difficulty bomb is expected to increase the validation of blocks from uh, every 15 seconds, sorry, every 14 seconds to more than 15 seconds in the next three months, and then within six months to 28 seconds or more, and then quickly exponentially increase the difficulty until it is impossible to mine uh, transactions on Ethereum. Um, now, that's uh, obviously not ideal, because due to the delays in the deployment of Metropolis, uh, now the difficulty bomb is upon us. And so one of the first changes that happens with Byzantium is pushing back um, the imposed difficulty that the difficulty bomb creates uh, to give more time to deploy proof of stake. A couple of other really interesting developments in Metropolis and Byzantium are the introduction of account abstractions, where um, gradually Ethereum is moving to blur the line between the two account types that are available. Um, at the moment, Ethereum has two types of accounts. There are externally owned accounts, or EOAs, which are accounts that are owned by systems outside of Ethereum with private public key pairs. Um, wallets, for example, in Ethereum are externally owned accounts. Um, and contracts. Contracts are the other type of account where money is managed by um, the code executed by a smart contract. They have some dif differences between them, and the way they're validated is different. The way they uh, pay for gas is different, uh, and these differences are going to gradually be abstracted so that um, they behave more and more the same until eventually Ethereum only has one type of account. And there's no difference between an account that has a private key behind it or some other mechanism for um, authorization or signing, um, and an account that's managed by smart contract code. They will behave identically. Another big change is the introduction 
of the ability for intermediary accounts to pay for gas. So today, if you run a transaction that executes smart contract code, that transaction has to pay for the gas. The smart contract itself can't pay for the gas. And if the smart contract calls another smart contract, which calls another smart contract, which calls another smart contract, then the gas is still paid by the first transaction that initiated this chain of calls. Um, with Byzantium, the intention is to allow intermediate uh, contracts to pay for gas themselves. So you can call a contract with a transaction, and then when that contract calls another contract, it can pay for all or some of that gas. I think that includes most of the changes we'll see in Byzantium, but of course it's still in flux, and uh, there may be more changes introduced in Byzantium, or maybe some of the changes will be pushed back into Constantinople uh, for the second part of the Metropolis uh, upgrade. Marcus asks, why would one use MetaMask or My Ether Wallet um, or My Crypto? Is it just that they can hold multiple Ethereum-based tokens, or do they have more useful capabilities? Marcus, MetaMask, My Ethereum Wallet, and sorry, My Ether Wallet and My Crypto are three lightweight clients and wallets. What they do is they don't just implement wallet functionality; they also uh, expose to your browser or make available to your browser the Web3 JavaScript interface that allows uh, DApps, decentralized applications, to run in your browser and access the Ethereum network through this wallet to create transactions, um, to access contracts, etc., etc. So um, these are more than just wallets. They're wallets and lightweight clients uh, that can expose the application programming interface that allows a web application to access the Ethereum network. So, yes, they can hold multiple Ethereum-based uh, tokens, uh, but they can also support web applications that access Ethereum. Sudakar asks, is the EVM, Ethereum wallet, and MIST the same thing? If not, what are the differences, and how do you install each? Um, these are three different things. Uh, MIST is a uh, user interface or DAP browser. So it is a uh, front end that allows you to um, access an interface with decentralized application. And so a DAP browser like MIST is a wallet, a client, and a front, uh, a front end user interface. Um, so MIST is all three of those things. And there are a few others. Uh, Parity Wallet has its own uh, graphical user interface and front end. Um, my Ether Wallet and My Crypto are also in that category. Ethereum Wallet is one application that runs within MIST, which is just a simple wallet running as a decentralized application. It's really just a front end uh, to a simple Ethereum wallet. And EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, is a, um, it's a virtual machine that executes smart contract code that has been compiled into bytecode, which is a bit like a machine language. Uh, EVM, uh, an EVM runs inside every Ethereum client and is used to validate every Ethereum transaction. It's also run by miners in order to validate transactions, um, and it's how smart contracts get executed. So, um, MIST and Ethereum Wallet uh, use a client. Uh, in the case of MIST, for example, they use the Go Ethereum client or Geth, and that client has within it an EVM for validating uh, transactions and executing smart contracts. So um, there is an EVM inside Geth, which is inside MIST. Um, perhaps that helps you understand some of the differences. Are smart contracts agreed upon, or are they more of a saying? This is how I function. If you want to interact with me, you have to follow these rules. Gabriel, I think part of the challenge here is the word smart contract. And for many people, this is very confusing. The word smart contracts themselves leads people to believe that this is somehow a contract. 
a contract as in the undersigned, I, Andreas Antonopoulos, agree upon presentation of a receipt for the uh, delivery of oranges to pay $3 to Gabriel Gomez, um, et cetera, et cetera, and that they have some kind of contractual element to them. They're called smart contracts, but effectively they're not smart and they're not contracts. I like to remind people that smart contracts are really dumb programs. They're programs. They're programs that have things like, if the input is 3 and the date is X, then do Y. Um, and these little programs are not particularly smart. In fact, they're not smart at all. They uh, will follow the rules exactly as written in the software. And if you don't account for all possible um, inputs that might uh, enter your smart contract, you can have bugs, you can have problems, you can have unanticipated situations. Uh, you can also not account for anything that's happening in the real world. Again, we talked about the Oracle pro problem. So, for example, um, in the past, people had suggested that you could have smart contracts that control the renting out um, of an apartment. Um, and um, automatically collect payment and manage insurance so that you can rent an apartment uh, in the form of, say, Airbnb, which is a known company for private apartment rentals. And you know, the question I always ask in those cases is, okay, and how do you account in the smart contract for the fact that the next morning the, um, the guests found uh, someone drowned in the pool, uh, floating face down? Um, you know, life has exceptions. And you're not going to write in the smart contract what happens with the insurance payment if someone drowns in the pool, or whatever else, or if someone trashes the house, or if they set fire to it, or whatever else might happen in the real world. And of course, once you have smart contracts like that that are successful, these problems tend to arise. So, Gabriel, to answer your question, smart contracts are not agreed upon. Really, um, there are software program. Someone wrote that. Um, in many cases, for different types of applications that you might want to engage in on the Ethereum network, there is more than one option. Um, for example, if you wanted to build a token, and you want to make it compatible with ERC-20, or you wanted to do a crowd sale, there are 25 different implementations of that. The only part where you can say you kind of agreed is when you decide to choose to use one of those 20 implementations, you are effectively agreeing to the rules that are written in that contract. Essentially, you're agreeing to that software, and you'd better understand how it's going to execute. The truth is that most people don't really know how that contract is going to execute, and they haven't read the code. And Even if they had read the code, very few people really understand all of the possibilities that can arise in software and all of the potential vulnerabilities. A perfect example of that is the DAO. Um, a lot of people invested money in the DAO. They thought they knew what the DAO could and couldn't do, and a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of the people who put money into it actually read the code. And Even those people who read the code uh, didn't understand the very, very subtle reentrancy bug that existed that led to a loss. So, again, you don't agree to a contract. You run the software, you choose which software to run, and hopefully you understand how that software is going to work. But in reality, you depend on other people having run that software for large amounts of money for long periods of time. In the end, most of the security and understanding of what the contract will do comes from maturity. It comes from having this run thousands of times for long periods of time with lots of money at stake, have people try to attack it and fail, and if it's still stable and it still does exactly what you think it will do, then you can put a bit more trust into this software. Sure, it's going to follow the consensus rules. Sure, the software is going to run as written, but it's very difficult to actually know what as written means. What is your opinion of humanly readable, legally binding smart contracts? Um, well, there's a really big problem with 
reconciling how we do law in the real world versus what a smart contract does in code. English, uh, and as such, any other human language is ambiguous. It's vague. It's very, very difficult to... It's impossible, in fact, to write something in English that has only one interpretation. The entire basis of law is about interpretation. And, um, and over time, legal contracts have matured over particular um, tests so that everybody knows why there's a comma before the and in that particular clause, probably because there is a long legal case where someone got sued over the exact meaning of that Oxford comma. For example, every single word you see in an, in an English legal contract that has a basis in English common law usually has a meaning that is very well established. The question of what the word person means, the qu question of what the word sale means, the question of what the word value means. These words have been tested by centuries of legal wrangling. The reason we want smart contracts to operate in code, in a smart contract language, uh, such as Solidity or Viper or any of the other smart contracts languages, is because um, that kind of programming language can be made to be much, much more precise and much less ambiguous than English. So that's the advantage of smart contracts. Making them human readable um, is a problem because uh, if if humans are able to read them, um, they may assume that what they're reading means something in English or whichever other language. But what the code actually does is something else. And reconciling those two, what you think it's going to do with what it's actually going to do, is a hellishly difficult problem. Also, whether a smart contract is legally binding. Um, making a contract legally binding or making a software program legally binding um, isn't really that interesting, important, or difficult. Um, you can write a paper contract that connects to the um, code contract that you've put in a blockchain um, and bind yourself to, with another person to that. But the bottom line is that in all of these cases, if there is a discrepancy between what the code did and what you think you signed up for, you're going to take someone to court. And when you take someone to court, uh, even if the payment has already been made and it's irreversible on an immutable blockchain, the the judge can reverse it. And if you if they can't seize the ether from you because you're an awesome cypherpunk who's hidden it so well, they'll take everything else you own and throw you in a cage, um, and continue to take everything else. Um, continue to take everything else you ever earn. So, unless smart contracts are executed between entirely anonymous people who have perfect OPSEC, uh, manage to never reveal their identity and interact entirely in virtual items without any access to the real world, um, there will always be interference from the law because people live within jurisdictions. And this is one of the challenges. Yes, and uh, just that makes a great point, which is person sale value are ambiguous and have still been legally challenged, and they're still challenged today. Um, and, and they will never be completely unambiguous. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of cases that tell us what can and cannot be considered a person, and many of those have enough precedent behind them to have weight, but we're changing society at the same time. So d d does, does an um, self-driving car count as a person in the driving code? Um, does Alexa, if she places an order for you um, online, count as a person in commercial law? We don't know yet. And these things are going to um, lead to more challenges and, and more definitions about exactly what that means and when you can use those terms. Um, so yes. There, the ambiguity that exists in human language and the interpretation that exists in law, these are not bugs. These are the features of the legal system. That's how the legal system works. First questions about smart contracts. Ali asks, how are operations conducted without having middlemen, and who does them? Can you please give us some real 
uh, world examples and when, which application is best for it. So Ali, when a smart contract is executed, it is a software program. And every single participant in the smart contracts platform, let's take for example, Ethereum, um, just because I know Ethereum a bit better than some of the other smart contract platform, but the same kind of logic applies to all of them. Um, every single smart contract execution starts with a transaction. So someone makes a transaction and that transaction um, has a contract as its recipient and tells that contract to do something. Basically, it's the input to a program. Smart contracts are just software after all. So what happens then? Who runs the smart contract? Well, the simple answer is everyone runs the smart contract. Everyone takes everyone who's participating in the Ethereum network, everyone who's running an Ethereum node, everyone who's running a business that's running an Ethereum node, the nodes themselves, the Ethereum nodes, the clients, the computers that are running as part of the Ethereum network, will receive that transaction. In order to validate that transaction, they execute the smart contract, and they pass as input to the smart contract that transaction inside uh, what is known as a virtual machine. And a virtual machine is basically a simulated computer. So in Ethereum, that's the Ethereum Virtual Machine, or EVM. And that simulated computer takes the transaction that was the input to the smart contract. It takes the transaction contract code, sorry, the contract code that is recorded on the blockchain, and it runs that as a software program with that input. Now, if all goes well, and that transaction should run successfully and produce some change in the state of the system, meaning that a variable is updated, maybe a payment is sent, uh, maybe some money is deposited, maybe something changes ownership, maybe, again, part of the memory or data store of the contract itself is updated with new values. These state changes are then recorded on the blockchain. Now, if you imagine thousands of computers all running the same software, they're not running it at the same time, there might be some slight differences in time, they're each running it locally on their own machine, and they're each using as input the same transaction, the same blockchain. Now, Given all of that, they should all arrive at the same conclusion. They should all run the program identically and produce the exact same results. Those results are what's recorded on the blockchain, those state transitions. So of the blockchain in a smart contract platform, we record the transaction as well as the, um, all of the results of the transaction, which may include events and changes to the state of the blockchain. Everybody can validate that they got the same result as everybody else. And when they download a new confirmed block from the Ethereum network, they can validate that block by running all of the transactions and smart contracts and seeing if they agree with the results that the miner has included in there. If they don't agree, then they will consider that block invalid and reject it. So therefore, just like in other blockchains, like in Bitcoin, everybody validates. Everybody who is participating as a node on the network validates every transaction. And in the case of Ethereum, to validate a transaction, that may mean, in most cases, means running the smart contract and arriving at the same results as anybody else. There are no middlemen that are running this. Um, this is done in a decentralized way. Now, all of that refers to um, the execution of a smart contract that uses information from within the blockchain. Now, when it's running in the EVM, it has a very limited set of information it can act on. And that's because all of that information has to be part of the consensus rules. It has to be the same for everybody who's trying to run that contract so that they can all validate it the same. That means that smart contracts are very limited in how much information they can access meaning that they can't access information about the real world. They can't say, what is the temperature today in Pensacola? That's not on the Ethereum blockchain. They can't say, what is the price of Ether today? Um, or something like that. And so, as a result, um, there are external services that sometimes supplement smart contracts, and these are called oracles. Which leads us great, straight into the next question by DDA. How can we make sure that an oracle feeding information to a smart contract is not corrupt? That's a great question, Didier. In fact, 
That's the biggest challenge with the technology of oracles. So you have this compromise situation whereby smart contracts can only act authoritatively and within the consensus rules on the information that's already stored in the Ethereum blockchain and the transaction they just received. And they can't validate the truth of anything that's in the transaction. Um, they can't validate what's happening in the real world. For that, we sometimes use external services called oracles. But the problem with that is if you trust that oracle, uh, that oracle has enormous power. Let's say, for example, that you had um, an insurance company, and that insurance company um, has a clause that says, if it rains more than 30 inches, um, in this particular region, that will trigger a claim on an insurance over property, so to cover rain damage. And so that smart contract in there has to constantly check how many inches of rain have fallen in a specific area. Now you can use an oracle for that. You can use an oracle that publishes every minute or every hour the cumulative amount of rain for the past 24 hours. And that if it exceeds a certain threshold, then you could trigger um, an insurance payout. Here's the problem. Now you've centralized a lot of the control and power into this oracle. So where is this oracle running? In most cases, this oracle ru is running outside of the Ethereum network. Or if part of it is running inside as a smart contract, certainly the information about how much rain fell in the last 24 hours is coming from outside, and that source has to be trusted. There's a couple of ways to do to get around this problem. One of the ways uh, is to use a certain type of oracle where instead of asking one source for the data, like how much it rained in a specific area, you have a decentralized mechanism whereby the oracle collects information from thousands of sources, and they must all agree. Effectively, you're running consensus rules um, on perhaps a, an external blockchain, a sidechain, or another blockchain that is used uh, in order to arrive at a common truth. So at that point, if everybody out of a thousand people who are running um, rain sensors in Pensacola, Florida, and they all report within the range of 28 to 30 inches of rain, then you can say, okay, that information is more decentralized and we can trust it. Why does this matter? Well, part of the reason it matters is because smart contracts execute automatically. And when they execute automatically, they also execute uh, in a way that cannot be reversed. So imagine a situation whereby you have um, an insurance contract and it's going to pay out. If you hack the oracle and make it report the wrong amount of rain, exaggerating the amount of rain, and you trigger the insurance company to pay out all of these uh, claims, then you can effectively defraud the insurance company. And therefore, smart contracts only operate on whatever information they have. If you put garbage in, you get garbage out. And one of the challenges with interacting with the real world is how do you know that information is correct, and how much trust are you putting into a single provider? If you centralize trust, then that creates an enormous incentive for people to um, basically compromise that centralized system because they could receive billions of dollars, presumably, um, in insurance payouts. Arguably, no one's going to do that anytime soon. No one is going to write a smart contract that will automatically pay out billions in the case of uh, an event coming from an oracle. And, and this is where the real world of smart contracts uh, really where the rubber hits the road, if you like, because um, it's exactly these challenges that, that mean that we're very, very far away from many of the alternative uses of the blockchain that people discuss today, um, simply because you, you can't put that much dependence on a fully automated system, especially if it has a centralized part of trust.